How about you? I'm Hank. Welcome to Hamiltonville Farm. In today's video, I've assembled some experts to help me talk about some will it start topics that you guys have been asking about in the comments. So in this video, I've got Matt from Diesel Creek, Wes from Watch West Work, Lance over at Restored, Thomas over at Mortsky's Repair, and Josh over at Sleeper Dude 88. These five guys will help me explain some of the process for the will it start videos that we all do and hopefully answer some of the questions that you have. I'll put the link to all their channels in the description below and pin a comment so that you can go check out their channel, subscribe to them, watch their videos. They all do amazing work. So let's get started and let's talk about some of the things that we talk about amongst us other YouTubers when we do Will It Start videos. I'll start the video off with my good friend Matt from Diesel Creek. A lot of you guys watch Matt and you know what kind of good content he produces. Matt's gonna to talk to us about some of the things he looks for in different types of diesel engines. And he's also gonna to talk to talk about and touch on a few areas like auxiliary things to look for when cranking in the engine up. Okay, Matt, take it away, buddy. Alrighty. So what we've got right here is a Deutz diesel, um, which is a German air-cooled diesel. So there's no radiator, no coolant in the block or anything like that. It's just basically like an overgrown Briggs and Stratton five horsepower with all the little fins on it. And this blower sucks in air and forces it across the cylinders, thus keeping it cool. These are pretty well regarded engines. They seem to run quite a while and relatively problem free from what I know. I don't know much about them though, other than that. So I guess before we even try to do anything here, we should probably pull the plug here check the oil see if it even has any uh, it's very very black but it's there so I guess that's a good sign doesn't look like it has water in it that's a good sign so I'm trying to study the fuel system here and figure out exactly what we need to do to get this thing fuel uh, in the event that it even turns over and I grabbed the throttle arm here and uh, Yeah, that's, that's a problem. So that thing is your throttle arm. And I, I don't know exactly what that looks like on the inside of that pump, but that's definitely a major problem. I'd say we can't run it until we have that squared away. So we're not off to a good start here. So anytime you're going to tackle an old diesel like this that's been sitting a long time, or any engine for that matter, and... You want to make sure the thing even turns before you go just trying to jam the starter on. Sometimes engines are easy to get a bar on or something, and that's the preferred way to, uh, you know, make sure they'll turn over. In this case, we could probably throw a wrench on this nut right here that's easy to get to, um, and maybe we'd be able to turn everything that way. But, you know, your crank is actually the, be the best way. But in this case, there's a drive shaft coming off of that, so there's no easy way to put a socket down there or a wrench or something. I guess you could use a pipe wrench. I don't think I have one big enough with me to fit on that. Other ways you could do it would be to either pull the starter off or sometimes you can get into the flywheel and uh, use a bar and try to bar it over with the teeth on the flywheel. You just got to watch you don't damage the flywheel when you're doing that. So Provided you do all that and then the engine doesn't appear to be moving or free, things you have to look for as well would be something just like that drive shaft. You know, what does that run to? Well, in this case, it runs to a line shaft which spins the counterweight in the drum, which makes this thing vibrate. So, you know, if the engine doesn't want to move, you got to make sure whatever it's connected to isn't the reason it's stuck. Other things could be water pumps, alternators, stuff like that, power steering pumps if it's in a truck. Things like that can, you know, be holding it via the belt or, you know, a lot of diesels have gear driven air compressors, stuff like that. Accessory drive stuff is what you need to check and make sure that isn't what's holding up your engine. Thanks a lot, Matt. I appreciate the help. We're going to continue on with just some hard-hitting facts about will it start type stuff. And we're going to go to my good friend, Wes. Now, me and Wes have been buddies for a long time. We text each other often about things that are going on in the YouTube world, mechanic world, things like that. He's a super, super smart guy. One of the smartest mechanics that I've ever met. So he's going to talk to us a little bit about 
diagnosing engines and problems in engines if you don't have a lot of sophisticated equipment. Wes, what you got, buddy? Hi, folks. My name is Wes. I have a little YouTube channel called Watch Wes Work, where we frequently attempt to diagnose and repair things with varying degrees of success. Now, here in my shop, I have access to all kinds of fancy diagnostic tools. But my friend Hank has asked if I could demonstrate diagnosing a problem quickly using limited tools. So today we're going to attempt to diagnose a truck that will not start using only five tools. A flashlight, a four-in-one screwdriver, a crescent wrench, a test light, and some combustion in a can. There is one more tool I'm going to use. It's not strictly required, but if you have it, it makes the process so much faster. Information. These are fantastic for kind of entry level DIY type people. The information is simplified. There's a lot of pictures and diagrams. Uh, the problem with these is that they're very condensed. So just for comparison, see the thickness of this book that covers what five different engines. This is the factory service manual set just for the 7.3 power stroke diesel engine, just for the 1997 model year. So this engine needs five things to run. It needs air and fuel, and those have to be compressed. Then it needs a source of ignition, and that has to happen at the proper time. Now this is a diesel engine, so if it has fuel and compression, the ignition should take care of itself. So I think what we're gonna do is we'll disable the glow plugs by disconnecting the relay and then we'll give her a little shot of ether and just see if it'll run on ether. That'll tell us if the base compression is good, if the base part of the engine is good. Then we'll go after the fuel system. All right, using my test light with it hooked up to battery negative, we can check the glow plug controller over here and there's no power anywhere. Let's try right in the turbo. You hear it pick up a little bit, it's trying to go. Maybe it's just too cold. Anyway, let's not get discouraged. Uh, the key's on right now. We should have power to the shutdown solenoid on the injection pump, and we don't. I fixed, fixed the main wire to the glow plug relay, which is that guy right there. But with the key on, we should also have power here, and we don't. So that's a problem. I found a wiring diagram. And it looks like it comes right out of the fuse box. And that one is blown. All right, we got a new 20 amp maxi fuse. Shove that guy in there. See if our wait to start light comes on. It's been relocated. Uh, interesting. All right, we got the fast idle screwdriver installed. I'm just going to jump the solenoid or the relay, sorry, and uh, We'll see what happens. Uh, we got fuel leaking out of all the injector lines. One, two, three, four. Well, I guess that's good. We're getting fuel to the injectors. Let me uh, tighten those. We'll see what happens. Well, we got a problem on cylinder one. It has this little extension. Somebody cross-threaded it. Really mangled it. Well, I did the best I could with it. That should work. <laughs> ah, 
there's no way. There's so much blow by. <laughs> oh lordy lordy lord hey it runs well if you're like me you have a lot of unanswered questions and unfortunately that's just the way she goes a lot of times my advice would be not to get bogged down too much by that you know worst case scenario there's always another way thanks for watching how about you Thanks a lot, Wes. That's pretty cool. I appreciate you doing that for us. Now, the next guys we're going to show is a channel called Restored. In my personal opinion, they make the best videos on YouTube. The editing that they use, the scripts, the uh, angles of the cameras, uh, just, I mean, it's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's like a TV show. It's like a full-up production TV show. And the guys are just so down-to-earth, so, um, so humble. It, it's insane. It's if you haven't checked out Restored, like I get, I'm going to put all these channels below. But make sure you check out Restored because these guys are top notch, and they're going to talk to you about some of the things that they take with them into the field, some of the things they look for when they're looking at old vehicles. But they do a really, really good job of explaining it. So I'll let them take it away. Hey, Hank. First off, we just want to say that we're really appreciative of you allowing us to be on this channel. Uh, we love what you guys are doing over there and we're super excited to be a part of this project. If you guys don't know who we are, uh, we're just a family from a small northeast Texas town and we have a YouTube channel called Restored. Today we would just like to share with you guys some of the things that we do to prepare to go out to get these vehicles on the trailer or even get them up and running on the spot. Now the first thing I would say is just go ahead and make you a list. Without a list, you'll never know if you're forgetting something. Now some of the important things on our list that we found out over time is of course you need you a good trailer. On that trailer, it's always nice and handy to have you a good working winch, but if not, you can always just bring along a come along, a chain hoist, just something to try to pull the vehicle out of where it's been sitting for some time now. Another thing that we also like to bring along is plenty of shovels, plenty of jacks, chains, straps, you name it, this list is going to continue to grow. Now for a lot of the vehicles that we find, they're actually out in the woods, so another important key piece to us is just having a lot of good chainsaws, machetes, electric power saws, whatever it may take to go ahead and cut those trees out of the way to move the vehicle from where it's been sitting. Now if you just don't have access to a lot of tools like that, it's not going to be a super big problem. A lot of the times we've showed up to get these vehicles and just don't have the tool we need. That's where you just use common sense, try to find some things around the area that you might be able to use to make the job a little easier on yourself. So once you've got a game plan of trying to get the vehicle on the trailer, another key tool to have is just some air, whether that be a compressor or something you can air the tires up or just an air tank along the way. Now a lot of y'all would be completely amazed at some of the tires that we've been able to air up over time. And just because they look old and dry rotted, sometimes they'll have tubes in them and go ahead and air up. Now be extremely careful on some of these old wheels and tires though, because you never know when something might go wrong and it blow up on you. Be sure you got plenty of charge batteries, a statch block if you've got a good healthy winch, and a lot of extra time because some of these things can be quite contrary. Most of the time these old vehicles are parked out there for a reason and you always get the story that it was running before they parked it out there and that. How well it was running we don't know uh, and how, how much mother nature has taken over and, and rusted up things and that, you know, it changes everything that, that you're expecting on just going out there hitting the key and cranking it up. The first thing we do is we'll pop the hood, check up underneath, see if there's any kind of critters or what, what's built a nest up underneath there and that. Uh, a lot of times they're just completely packed full. If they are, 
we'll kind of get a get a view of where we can grab hold of the, the fan and maybe try to turn it over to see if the motor is actually locked up. But if not, if that fan will move, you know, we'll check to see what uh, see what next steps we need to do. Uh, we bring out just our basic tools. You know, it may just be a small Harbor Freight set, some hammers, screwdrivers, uh, jumper cables, batteries, just anything that might might be used to get these things running. And a lot of times, you just bring extra stuff that you know things that you may not even think you're going to need. Uh, because the odds are you'll probably need something else different and you don't want to be out there trying to make do with a screwdriver when you need a hammer. Bring gas, bring batteries, extra parts, penetrating oil, and be sure you bring extra water because you know if you get out on the road this thing's going to try to get hot on you now and you're going to be sitting on the side of the road wishing that you'd have brought some. So one important thing that you should be focused on whenever you're trying to get these vehicles out of the woods is paying attention to your surroundings. A lot of times you get so caught up in cutting stuff out and trying to make a game plan of how to pull these vehicles out, but you're not really paying attention to where you're standing or paying attention to what you're cutting around you. So really it's important to make sure that you're not putting yourself in any kind of harm's way and uh, trying to do it the safest way possible. You need to make sure that you bring you some gloves, boots, safety glasses, stuff that may seem really small, but in the long run are very important to bring just to ensure some safety. As a filmer, I always seem to catch things a little bit beforehand before the guys do. So, uh, you know, we run into fires, animals, stuff like that. So it's really important to be aware of your surroundings and uh, try to catch things before it gets too bad. So we hope some of these tips will help you along the way of whether you're rescuing a vehicle out of a field, out of a barn, or even if it's in your backyard. Uh, you really can never be over prepared on these things because you never know what to expect. Be sure that you always have fun with it. And don't let just a few problems discourage you and completely ruin your day. And most importantly, always remember to pray. So Hank, thanks again for the opportunity. If you guys think you might be interested in following along with our channel, as well as the other channels within this video, be sure that you check out the description with the links below, and we hope that we see you in the future. Now back to you, Hank. I told you they were awesome, didn't I? Man, I'm telling you, these guys, those guys, they just make phenomenal videos. The next guy that makes good videos is Thomas over at Mortsky's Repair. Now, Thomas does a lot of square body stuff, a lot of gas engine stuff, and he's got a killer sidekick, uh, the little dog that he takes around with him. So Thomas is going to talk to us about some of the things that are minimum requirements for these Will It Start type videos. Thomas, help us out, buddy. Hey there, boys and girls of the YouTube world. Hamilton Farms has graciously asked Duff Dog and I to show you what we look for when we get some of this hot garbage running. So uh, here's a couple things that we look for when we drag something out of the weeds and want to get it running. You want to take it from here? Well, you're pretty quiet today, huh? Yeah, there's a lot of people out there with differing opinions than you, so probably best keep them to yourself. So we got a leaning tower of power here we're trying to get running, also known as the Slant 6 or the Hillside Hemi. Here's a couple things we look for. Completeness. Part of that completeness is a hood, and a hood that's latched, because water is your biggest enemy. Precipitation, condensation, all the Asians. You want to make sure it's got a hood on it and an air cleaner on it and a carburetor on it and an intake on it, all that stuff. Because if any of those are missing, you're going to get water into the cylinders. Same with exhaust. Even if the exhaust is cut off below the exhaust manifolds, it's uh, critters can get up in there. That's the other Asian infestation. You don't want the critters getting, making mouse houses in your cylinders. They go through the valves. They do their business in there. And then you get a stuck engine from all the Asians. And you don't want that. The other thing you get stuck is your carbonator. We freed this one up. But that's the other thing to look for. Make sure the carburetor's free. Grab your dipstick, Jimmy. Check that. Make sure that it's within the operating levels. If it's completely empty, you might have a hole in the oil pan or a rusted out oil pan. If it's over full, you might have condensation precipitation that got down into the oil pan either from water going down the carburetor or a cracked head blown out head gasket any of the above another thing to check is your coolant up here where it gets below freezing you always want to make sure that there's antifreeze in there if they add it full of water odds are it probably blew out a frost plug or cracked the block and it doesn't get much worse than that so check it make sure there's some nice green coolant in there for you folks that are uh, lucky enough to be down south, I don't know where you want to call it, what Asian that is, the southern nation, you uh, 
don't have to worry about that. But completeness, make sure the radiator hoses are there, your accessory brackets, your pulleys, your fan, all that stuff. The more complete it is, the better chance you're going to have to get it running. If you start with a project that's missing a carburetor and a exhaust manifold and a water pump, it's just that much more stuff you got to find. And you might go ahead and spend all your hard-earned money on that and it still might not run. So make sure it's complete. The other thing is, grab that fan, see if it turns over. This thing turns over super good. Oh, it's because the bottom pulley ain't turning. Make sure when you're turning that fan, you're pushing on the belt and then your bottom crank pulley is turning. You can also put the car in gear if it's a manual, rock it back for us, see if that engine turns over. And then, you know, if it's turning over, it's doing all that stuff. Some people like to pull the spark plugs out, check out the condition of those. Completeness as well, make sure your distributor's there. Three things you need to get an engine running. Spark, coming from your ignition. Fuel and air, coming from your carburetor. And compression, coming from Pistons, rings, valves, all that stuff closing in the right order that they're supposed to. So pull those spark plugs out, put a little oil down there, doesn't hurt the cylinders. Pull out the plugs, check the plugs, make sure that they're not all rusty, make sure that the bottoms of the plugs don't look like there's been some bad things going on there, like they're all beat up from a baseball bat fight. Check that stuff. You can pull the uh, breather cap off, look in there, see how rusty it is, make sure it's not all milky, stuff like that. Some engines like uh, 318, 360 Chryslers, 360, 390 Ford FE, stuff like that. They got rocker shafts, so it's best to just pull the valve cover off. Check and make sure that valve train isn't all rusty, because if that valve train is rusty on those rocker shafts, it'll bend your push rods when you turn it over. Another thing to look for. So those are some of the things that we look for. You know, completeness, why they parked it. You know, ask the previous owner if you can. Check the condition of the block, make sure there's not a rod hanging out the side, stuff like that. And then don't go and buy a carburetor and ignition system and throw a bunch of money at it. Just get it running with what you got. You can drizzle gas down it to see if it runs. You can clean up those old spark plugs. If you got to buy a spark plug wire or a battery cable, something like that. That's stuff that I like to do. I don't like to go and buy an engine that doesn't have everything on it for accessories and a water pump and a starter and all that. I have to go and find that stuff before I even get it running. So those are a couple of things that I look for. Hopefully that helps with your project. Thank you very much for watching. Check out these other channels. Check out our channel. Remember, it doesn't matter you get it done, as long as you're having fun. Sometimes old engines, they're not so fun. Sometimes they are. <laughs> I appreciate it, buddy. I tell you, the dog is really what, uh, he's got a really cool sidekick in his videos. So go check out Mortsky's Repair on YouTube. The next guy we got up is Josh over at Sleeper Dude. He does a lot of hot rodding stuff, so it's really, really cool to watch him turn some some old classic type cars and get them running again. And he has to he does a lot of things where he goes out and finds parts for his uh, projects that he's doing. So I asked him, I said, Josh, will you mind talking about where you get these parts from and how people can find parts when they're doing will it start type stuff? And so Josh, take it away and tell us where you get these parts at and how you go about finding that stuff. You ready for this? Hey, it's Josh and Ralphie here from the Sleeper Dude YouTube channel. Hank, we appreciate you letting us get involved with this project. And uh, we're going to be talking to you guys about where to get the best deals on parts, where to find them, where do we go. Well, I'm really bad about going to eBay, honestly, and buying stuff. But you don't always get the best deals there, especially on some like used stuff. Sometimes people want a little more for it than what you could get it for locally. So I'm bad to do that. Cause I'm really usually short on time but uh, like recently we needed some wheels for our motorhome project and uh, I looked on eBay I looked on Facebook marketplace and if I found anything it was like a hundred bucks a wheel so me and Ralphie went to the junkyard and we got some used wheels from the local junkyard for 25 bucks a piece and three of them still had good casings on them can you believe that so, uh, you know, sometimes you can get a lot better deal if you go to the junkyard and find something. It takes a little more time, but the time we spent in the junkyard was fun. We both really enjoyed it. Uh, we don't get to do it enough because we're out here making these videos, but uh, you can get good deals on eBay. Uh, I buy a lot of new stuff off eBay, uh, but probably on used stuff, go to a junkyard, maybe check out Facebook Marketplace. We get some used stuff off Facebook Marketplace, get the good deals there sometimes. Now with parts stores, I mean, you get all your different normal all parts chains. I usually tend to use O'Reilly's, but uh, really 
<laughs> the key to getting good stuff at a part store is finding a person that works there that knows what they're doing. Because a lot of you guys probably already know this, but you go to a part store and you've got a kid that doesn't know what he's doing or, or even an older person that doesn't know what they're doing. And if you can't tell them what year the car is and what motor's in it and they can't pull it up on their computer, they're absolutely useless to you. And if you're looking for a fitting or a bolt or something, it's really hard to find what you're looking for. Recently, we had a car uh, that we were needing a brake fitting for. It was the 64 Galaxy, right? The red one. Yeah. And we could not find this brake fitting. We went all around town to every parts store and couldn't find nothing. And then the next day I went to my normal parts store that was in the other town where I actually work at my day job. And I went right in there, they had it, they knew where to look for it. The only problem with the other stores was they didn't know what to look for because I couldn't tell them what car it was. So you gotta find good employees at these parts stores and that is the key to finding good parts at the parts stores. I appreciate you involving us in this and uh, check our channel out, Sleeper Dude. Sleeper Dude 88 on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And thanks again, Hank, for involving us in this project. All right, I appreciate that, Josh. You and Ralphie make a good team. I tell you, it's uh, really cool to see dads bringing their sons up in that kind of environment, so teaching them the ways, if you will. But there's some things that me and Wiley look for when we go out for our Will It Start videos. And so, Wiley, what do you think, uh, what are some of the, the first things that you look for and some of the obstacles you think that we might be facing when we go out to some of these vehicles? Well, you know, we look and see about the batteries, the Battery source, the power source, what's going to turn the starter. Right. Uh, 24 volt, 12 volt system. Yeah. Looking for, you know, fuel and air, if it's getting that fuel and air and stuff like that, you know, well, I guess make sure it's not locked up the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure right, right, right. Because usually if it'll spin, most time it'll crank. Yeah, that's why you'll notice that me and Wiley do 99.9% .9 of everything we do is diesel pre computers, right? right? And so if you can just get power to the starter, turning that starter and the engine ain't locked over and get a fuel delivered to it somehow or another, uh, it's going to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Get some air. You know, it's, 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 it's now some of the ways we do it's kind of comical sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't mean to be. But, uh, but there's some telltale signs you can look for for 12 to 24 volt systems. Uh, the gauges, what the numbers read in the gauges. Uh, the starter will tell you if it's 12 or 24 volts sometimes. And sometimes you can sling 24 volts onto a 12 volt starter right. to kind of help, you know, especially if it's been sitting there a while. That's right. Uh, so anyway, so those are the, some, the, the quick hits on some of the things that me and Wiley will look for when we go out to do our Will It Start videos. But we always try to think the, the nastier, the better. You know, we can find one that's in the woods or we can find one that's been abandoned for 10, 12, 15, 20 years even. Uh, those are the, the fun ones to do, right. you know. Plus, they're usually kind of cool cool vehicles and cool pieces of equipment that right. you don't see every day. So, hey, listen, I appreciate you guys watching. And remember, Jesus loves you.